Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All stream directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Joined as always by my inimitable co-host, one Tomas Marit. How you doing, Tom? Doing good, man. How are you? I hear you're in Palatine, Illinois. Yeah, it seems like only hours ago I was hanging with you guys at the Twit Brick House, and now I'm already, I, I'm, I've gone through Arkansas, now I'm here in Illinois, tomorrow it's Indiana, and what we just saw is the bit, the video everyone on the internet's talking about from one uh, Dan Trachtenberg of the Totally Rad Show, that is uh, Portal No Escape, right? That's the name of it? Yeah, Portal No Escape, it is sweeping the internet, like, Absolutely everybody All on Twitter. All the kids are watching the, the portal no escape. My Twitter feed is filled with like, you've got to talk about this. It's been years in the making. It's so awesome. It looks pretty great. Uh, I'll tell you what, and I don't mean to, uh, uh, it was it was a year and a half ago that I was performing at the Magic Castle in Hollywood, California, and all of the TRS boys came out and saw the show, and they were all very coy, talking about, oh, well, there's this thing, and we're really excited about it, and we blah, 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 and then the next day, I'm like, okay, man, I really wish I could know, and uh, it, Dan, the next day, I got an email from him say, I'm sending this to you with the understanding that you will absolutely delete this screenshot the moment you see it. And sure enough, just seeing one screenshot of the chick with the portal gun, and this is before Portal 2 was even announced. I mean, it was out of nowhere. I was just like, OMG. So it's been a year and a half of having to keep my mouth shut, and I'm so excited for him. He absolutely nailed, with, nailed it. Go check out Portal No Escape by Dan Trachtenberg. All right, let's first then, but before you do that, keep watching us, because we're going to talk about the big story. This just in, the big story. Words order not in, sense make will later. <laughs> uh, yeah, Good, so. Tom. Good. <laughs> How's you. that electroshock therapy working out for you? <laughs> and all right. Uh, Torrent Freak did a little investigating after we talked about this last week. Uh, Fox decided to delay their posting of shows on Hulu for eight days after air. So instead of the day after, you have to wait over a week to see the Fox which means, shows. Which means, it should be pointed out, that means that you will never ever be able to use Hulu to get caught up on your shows. If you miss an episode, you have no chance of getting caught up. You have to stay eight days behind perpetually or, or go pay for the episode if you want to get caught up to watching it live week to week. So we actually uh, thought, well, you know what, this is probably going to cause a little piracy. It's probably going to nudge some people towards illegal behavior. Torrent Freak decided to take a look uh, at some torrent indexes and see what they could see. It turns out that over the past five, the first five days of the new policy, the number of downloads from the United States for the latest episode of Hell's Kitchen increased by 114 percent compared to the previous three episodes. Uh, and MasterChef was even bigger. That one increased 189 uh, percent, again, just for the United States. So not scientific. Uh, you can't really make any like solid claims, but it does seem to indicate what we expected, right? That, you know, well, if you I, take yeah. away the option to watch it legally, you're not necessarily going to make people do what you want them to do. 
Well, and here's the other thing, too. I mean, these two shows, obviously, they're cooking shows, and I know that they're, they're elimination-style tournaments, and you do want to get caught up. They're almost like sporting events in that way. But, uh, but I would imagine that for hardcore narrative shows, it would be even higher if it's something where you're caught up in the story and you really want to know what happens. Although, I don't know, maybe I'm passing judgment on them just because, you know, they're cooking reality shows. But I would perceive that something like a, a Breaking Bad or, or, you know, that type of show, although obviously it's not on Fox, but uh, one of those narrative shows, I would imagine, would have an even higher rate. Well, it, that would be interesting, right? Because these are fall shows. Uh, I, I'm sorry, these are not fall shows. These are these are shows that are in the sort of uh, replacement time. Uh, so they're not the top shows. The top shows are going to be coming in September. I think that is when we'll actually find out how much of an effect this is going to have. There could be just some weird secondary effect that caused these two shows to jump in piracy this week. We don't we don't know for sure. It wasn't controlled for, but. If this goes on over time, and if the new shows start premiering in September, and people start, and you see that same increase, then I think you can make, it, you know, if not a hundred percent solid assessment, you can make a better assessment that this is not having the effect uh, that they wanted to. And in fact, Tim Stevens on Tech News Today said he wants to see the ratings for those shows to find out did they get a bump from taking Hulu off because we don't suspect that they did. Well, and, and I would have to imagine that that is the stated purpose for it, right? I would imagine the only logical reason to extend the delay would be because you want more people to watch live on their TV sets. And I, I bet you're right. I bet whatever bump there is is going to be lost in the noise of week-to-week of -week traffic on the show. But more importantly, I think this is a little clue as to how many people... Uh, what I think of as the Steam effect. Steam was the platform that caused me to go legit and be an honest games purchaser instead of pirating any of my games anymore. And uh, I wonder if there's a lot of BitTorrenters who are being seduced by the ease of platforms, for example, you know, like Hulu and the other ones out there. But uh, these are people who already probably have BitTorrent already installed on their computer. They're already familiar with how to grab stuff. But if it's not there on Hulu, they would rather have the convenience of watching it on Hulu. They'd rather have it be quick and easy. And they probably want, you know, proper views and don't mind the ads. And when they're taking, when that gets taken away from them and there's no way to play fair and win, then these are the people I assume who have no compunction with, that it's just, well, screw you. I'm going to get it one way or the other. All right. Tuesday's two-hour MasterChef finale uh, shot up in the ratings, delivering the show's best numbers of the season. Had 6.5 million viewers and a 2.6 preliminary adults 18 to 49 rating, up 30% from last year's finale. So that's interesting. They got a big spike in ratings. And again, same caveat applies. There could but, be lots yeah, of reasons why the rating goes up. Same reason the, that the piracy went up. In fact, it could be the same reason. It could be, you, hey, it's the finale, so more people are interested. Therefore, you get higher ratings and higher piracy. So you may be having no effect here at all. Or it may be that Fox is right, and they're like, you know what? If we take it away from Hulu, we'll drive people into two areas. Uh, but even though we're not making any money off the people who go get it on BitTorrent, we can make the money off the people who actually come to television, and so it's worth it. So what? What uh, are you, do you have any clue as to what a percentage of a bump they got for the live viewing on television? I, I mean, is up they didn't thirty double. percent from last year's finale? I don't know what percentage it was up over the previous week. Over the previous week, yeah. And I guess you're right. There is a lot. I mean, this is a far from scientific study. And, and uh, full discla disclosure, disclaimer here, we very well could just be seeing what we want to see and what we expect to see. There's a lot of random noise here. I got to imagine somebody, uh, you know what, I'll bet within the big media companies, they already have people who are tracking all this stuff and putting together reports. Oh, yeah. And it could be that that's why they're ta making these decisions, because they know they can. And as, and as I've said for, for a long time, I'm convinced that that they know exactly how bad it is. They know what consumers want. They're not uh, they're not idiots. I think they're just trying to delay long enough to to you know prep whatever their next phase is. Now, Hell's Kitchen yesterday drew the top ratings for the evening, but it slipped 17 percent compared to last week. That's because they're all on BitTorrent. No. Uh, that's <laughs> that's so very interesting as well. Uh, yeah, well, and I, I wish I wish they were programs I was more familiar with. You know, both of these. I think it's interesting that they picked two cooking reality shows 
to do for this. Uh, I don't know if that was just, you know, the... Well, the, I, I think was... what they did was they picked August to introduce this new policy because it's going to affect the fewest amount of people. I mentioned that when we talked about the story the first time. I think it's smart to put it out there when there aren't huge hit shows on and suddenly everyone notices. Although they will this... notice when the fall shows premiere in September. Does anybody BitTorrent? I, I know we see a lot of piracy of sports on live streaming, but does anybody BitTorrent the, the events afterward? What, uh, I'm, sorry. I'm talking about like uh, uh, basketball. I, I, I'm wondering about piracy in sports. Obviously, we're talking about you know reality cooking right you mean, now. Do people go and torrent uh, games? Games after the fact. Sure. Like they already yeah, know I think they do. Won. I think they'd rather see them live. I, I think that's the same as like, do people DVR sports? Yeah, sure. Some people do and watch uh, it later. From the chat room, some people are confessing to pirating yeah. uh, the, uh, the UFC or if somebody misses a game. So right. uh, they say, yeah. That's interesting. There are definitely sports torrents. I mean, I know when I was trying to find rugby uh, a few years back, there were a lot of people pointing me towards torrents because you could find them pretty fast after the games were over. I mean, they get, they get posted pretty rapidly. Uh, the problem is you have to download them right away because the interest falls off much faster than a serial television show. And so if you're going like a couple weeks later, there's no seeds. Uh, there's, yeah. you know, there's no distribution. I, I forget about that. Yeah, because BitTorrent is, um, uh, it's really different because on BitTorrent, obviously, the more popular it is, the, the easier it is to get. Whereas on something like for the people who pirate uh, use, doing Usenet, the more popular it is, the more likely it is to get a takedown by one of the big media companies. So if it's old and kind of forgotten, then it's more likely to be complete because what they'll do on those sites is they'll, they'll when they do a takedown, they'll just remove one block and, and people will download entire, you know, full gigabyte, but the whole file will be corrupt and useless by the and time they get And don't forget, ABC is also going to have the same policy as Fox. Fox just got to it first. So we have yet to see what kind of effect this is going to have on ABC. Uh, but, you know, early results... At least, you know, non-definitive but early results show that this looks pretty much the way we expected. Yeah. Well, and, and, and again, viewed through a lens of a non-scientific survey, <laughs> you know, interpreted by two guys who clearly want to be right, we can definitively state that we were right. I'm actually more surprised that people would go to torrents than just finding streaming sites that don't expose you to as much risk. Because uh, you can find this stuff on sites where they're just streaming the shows, and, well, it, and then you don't uh, have to download anything. I, well, you, you do have uh, a lot of those sites, you have significant virus risks. I know that when I did that special in Indonesia last year, a bunch of people over Twitter, they found a site that was rebroadcasting my performance on the, the, the Mahakaria special that we did. And, uh, but they, uh, they were like, all of a sudden I see the backlash tweets where they're like, that site's real virusy, Brian. You may not want to recommend yeah, people. Yeah, and, tor and torrents have the same risk. Uh, you have to find good seeds and all that stuff because there can be poisoned torrents. Um, but there's but there's also you there's know there's the increased in risk because you cannot participate in a torrent without uh, because they don't want the huge backlash. They only go after people who are doing the sharing, which is uh, you know fine if if you know if they, back in the days when it was everything was an FTP, you could go to the FTP. It was the guy who was hosting the FTP who had to worry about getting slammed by the man. Nowadays though, the way BitTorrent works is if you download, you automatically start sharing, so you become one of the providers, yeah. which is why I know that there are a lot of people who uh, uh, use Usenet services like Giga News or... Right. Uh, or, or Mega or, Upload know. is another way to go that, that right. exposes you to less risk because you're just downloading. Right, correct, correct. But, and, uh, and, you know, the point of all this is not to say you should go out and, and infringe copyrights. The point of this is to say there are all these other ways that people can go and find things. They're not 100% perfect, but when you give them no option, they're going to go and use them. Do you got yes, you, yes. Uh, in fact, the Register had a big article today saying, look, music industry, not talking about TV, but same issue, you need to compete on price. Uh, and that's working in the United States and Europe where we have undrm relatively inexpensive music. But where piracy is rampant in music is in places like Latin America and Asia where they actually don't have the right price. They're trying to sell it as the same price as Europe and U.S., and that's too expensive there. 
Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, I didn't think about that. And, and but, you know, and we see this from uh, from stuff like pharmaceutical companies. I know that they're often uh, derided here in the United States for charging so much for their medicines when they're new. But when they're effective, important medicines, they they do bring them out for an expensive price here in the United States and Western countries. But in places where there's no chance they're going to get thirty dollars for a flu shot or whatever, they make them available in Africa for very poor areas for extremely cheap prices. And everybody wins. People get healthy and they're able to derive the maximum benefit i don't see any reason that we can't follow some of the same model for that when it comes to our our entertainment all right let's move on to the film foul Speaking of not giving people the opportunity to get the stuff that they want to get legally, uh, Sky Movies apparently has a stranglehold on on-demand rights in the UK for movies that may not be broken by competition authorities until 2014, according to Ender's analysis. So Netflix moving into Europe, Love Film, which already exists in Europe, are going to have many fewer A-list titles in their catalogs uh, than they should have because the competitors own the rights. So this is just a case, this is not a case where they're just flat out not allowed to exist, but, but as a reality, the, uh, th they are not going to get their hands on any of the, uh, due to previous agreements, they're not going to get their hands on any of the good stuff for another two years or three years. Now the good news is the Competition Commission re provisionally ruled that these licensing deals with Sky actually constitute a lack of competition in the new landscape that wouldn't have 10, 15 years ago, but now they do. So that could give them an opening uh, to actually force these licensing terms to be opened up uh, and allow more people to bid on them. I mean, the idea that, that you can lock something up to one provider at a time made sense when you only had five different ways. And if you saw it on the plane, the fact that you couldn't watch it on your television at home really wasn't a big deal. But when you've got like almost essentially a limitless number of possible distributors on the internet uh right. it, it it isn't very competitive to to lock up these licensing deals like that uh yes i agree with that and, and i'll tell you what uh, on a personal note i do not look forward to the increased number of letters that we get at frameratereshow at gmail.com with people complaining that they can't get on netflix or the service isn't good for them being in europe other bad news the blu-ray discs uh for star wars apparently going to have more changes to the films oh, instead geez. of just uh, giving you the films. Did I hear? Did I hear Jason groan? Yes, did I you hear did. Rumbling off screen. From you this? did. Yes, you did. It's just it's <laughs> ridiculous. The the originals were so great in and of themselves. Why? You know, continue when I, this? there's there's a great uh, copyright video going around. I'm trying to find who uh, shared it with me. Ronak underscore D on Twitter. R O N A K underscore D shared it. Uh, it's Actually, on YouTube. Actually, can we, we go ahead and take a look at a bit? Maybe we'll we'll see if we can get that queued up in time for uh, for Interferon, because I wouldn't mind watching a, a couple of minutes of that, starting at the uh, 30, to 30 seconds to one minute uh, segment. It was so good. It's about five minutes long, so we can't show the whole thing, but uh, but really makes a very compelling case for why, why not only is our, our copyright law silly as it is now and, and way out of, uh, out of touch with the reality of why people create content, but how the things we love actually are made worse as a result of, of the copyright law from an artistic standpoint. And I hadn't heard that argument before, which is, which is one of the reasons I really dug that. Well, and the reason I brought it up is because he uses the, uh, the release of Star Wars in 1977 as an example, because uh, the original copyright law was for a period of 28 years, and it's been extended and extended over time. And he points out, he's like, yeah, 28 years uh, is is something where you could actually go and remake Star Wars without needing a license. But because it's now 95 years in the United States, that means that George Lucas's innovation is protected. So he can release it on VHS and then re-release it on VHS with new digital feed and then re-release and, and it just like the screen starts piling up with all these different formats and the way he's changed things and re-released them. Uh, so what are the changes that are happening in this Blu-ray release? <laughs> Well, okay, and here's and here's the thing. This is the problem that um, uh, you know, and we we have talked at length about uh, you know how at least I feel about George Lucas's relationship with the Star Wars universe. But one of the things that happened with the special editions was he got really excited to um, 
uh, to use new technology. And the problem is a lot of it is dated and, and was used incorrectly. So some of the changes are stuff like uh, fixing the digital 5.1 surround sound. Some of them are, they redid the lightsabers, but they redid them with mistakes in them to where it looks like they're overlapping and not connecting right. So they goes back and fix that. Some of them are, are kind of curious to me, like, like what, what do you get out of it? For example, in episode one, The Phantom Menace, they use, uh, for the majority of the movie, they use a puppet Yoda, which of course that was good enough for Empire Strikes Back, except for the scene at the end where they show him walking along. Now they're going back and they're making him all CG throughout the entire thing. And I just don't know, I, it's, it's I, I don't, I would really, really, really like to believe that this isn't a, uh, gonna be, <laughs> It's it's a joke at this point. It's it's of course he's always going back and mucking with it when when pretty much it's I think relatively unanimous that everybody just wants the originals. Let them be what they are what they are. You know, let them be flawed masterpieces. You know, go ahead, let us see the puppeteer's hand in the in the wampa or or whatever. You know, it's like that's that's fine. That's fine. Well, I think you should have the option, especially when you've got a large stories medium, medium like Blu-ray. I understand them saying, "Look, we want it to be consistent." You know, we Yoda looks this way in all these other movies, so now if you watch the whole thing, suddenly it looks weird, or you can see the puppet hand. But give me get, Hold on. <sighs> give me the option. <laughs> that's, that's Jason saying he's bored. He's done with this discussion. <laughs> give me the option to see too. the original as well. That's one of the benefits of having an optical storage medium like this is I should have these abilities to say, oh, I want to watch the original or I want to watch the other one. Angel Mercury also brought up a good point in the chat room. She says when they change these films, that gives them the opportunity to register a new copyright. So yes. it, it makes it easier to defend in court because now you have a new work that is copyrighted on top of your original work that was copyrighted. So uh, real quick, if we can, uh, and, and Adam12 in the chat room, you know, we go back and forth. He's, he's you know, he believe, he's a believer in the prequels and I am not. But uh, when I said it's relatively unanimous, he says, no, it's far from that. If we could just get a flash ruling from the chat room, are you guys, as far as the original trilogy, warts and all, or you like continuous improvement on it? So warts and all or continuous improvement, what side of the aisle are you guys on? See, I'm on both sides. I, I want to see the improvement. I actually like the idea of him, like, throwing in Jabba the Hutt looking like the slug in the original, because that's interesting. And it was a scene that wasn't even in the original to begin with. But I also want the ability to say, I want to watch it the way it originally came out. <laughs> you know, I see all warts, 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 and I just see one from Adam12 that says, continuous improvements, parentheses, and I hate you, Brian. <laughs> 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 it's totally, it's, it's unfair. It's a stacked audience. But, uh, but I, I mean, certainly there's enough of them who want to see, you know, because as far as I understand, there's still, at this moment, you cannot buy the original movies archived the way they were originally made. And that breaks my heart. All right. Well, let's uh, move on to the almost final standings of our summer movie draft. Oh, my gosh. This is it. This is it. Yeah, we do not have any more movies in the draft. So this is, what do we got? Two weeks, three weeks that we're given? Yeah, I think I think we had said September 15th as the final day, but I have a pretty good feeling that we're going to know for sure where we all end up right now. So what are we at on the, on the standings right well, now? Right now, Sarah Lane, obviously still in first, is going to stay in first because she had Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. She's got like $849 million. Brian Brushwood in second place. You, yes. Your strategy almost paid off. If it weren't for Harry Potter, I think you would have had a very good chance at locking this up. Uh, but $599 million, you're in second place. I have somehow ended up in third place, and it has to do entirely with Rise of the Apes and Smurfs 3D. <laughs> Those yes. two movies yes. have yes. put me over the top. Rise I of the am... Apes, $135 million. Smurfs 3D, $118 million. So those two have, have floated me up to $525 million. Right on your heels, Brian. Uh, dude, I'm telling you, this is fascinating the way it all came out. First yeah. of all, because the, the opinions flip-flopped so wildly. Because I remember I'm so happy that Rise of the Planet of the Apes was such a moneymaker for you because especially when you were so defeated two weeks ago, this thing has continued to make cash for you. It's the number from, one like n amount per dollar spent. I spent 10 bucks on it in the draft. And you were apologizing it from the very beginning. You were saying like, oh, I don't know, this is just a throwaway or whatever, but it ended up being the buy of the entire, it outdid Fast and the Furious for me. Uh, yeah, dude, it was, that was the buy. Even better, you made more money per dollar spent than Sarah did with Harry Potter. That's the amazing part to me. So I am not crying. I'm not complaining. I am extraordinarily surprised and pleased with my third it, place ranking. Even if it goes back down, 
I, you know what? The, these two movies have helped me and inf helped inform my movie drafting strategy for our winter movie draft. I can't wait for that. Yeah, no, already getting emails asking us when we're going to start that. We'll get details to you on that soon. But I do want to point out one thing. I endured three months of being called the April Fool for my strategy of buying all those low-priced movies early in the league. And I just want to point out, yes, Sarah won. She stomped all of us. But of all the also-rans, I'm, I'm number one of the losers. I'm king of the losers. King of the losers. You're king of lose. Uh, Spy Kids did, d disappointed, though. It only yeah. was number three in the box office. Actually, Rise of the Planet of the Apes outgrossed Spy Kids. I was very surprised by that. The Help took number one. Uh, and now we, we actually won't have a natural way to tell you what's coming up this week because we, we we'll have a break between our two uh, movie drafts between now and October. Uh, well, so, we'll you, know, you know, don't be afraid of the darks coming out this week. Higher ground. There's really not that much that's in the frame rate audience interest. Uh, that's coming out right now, but there, there's some there's other stuff in the offing. Apollo 18 is going to be coming out Labor Day weekend. If I can, real quick, uh, it's worth heading over to draft.nsfwshow.com to see how the chat room did. Uh, I'm really surprised by how many names I recognize at the very top of the rankings. You can tell the difference between people who are new to the game versus those who have been around the block. Uh, first place right now is Dizzle with 984 million dollars, <laughs> just shy. Of a billion freaking dollars. Patrick Delahanty is number two. With Diddy Delahanty. Science Joe, uh, 983. Uh, Angel Mercury, 954. Uh, Todd, Chris Wall, Jack Dole. Wait, Angel Paul, Mercury Patty and Todd Dana. are dead even. They had the exact same movies, huh? Yeah, yeah. But it looks like it looks like the winning combination at this moment was Fast Five, Thor, Zookeeper, Harry Potter, the Smurfs, and the Change Up. See? And, uh, and the, the Smurfs, I pick. always defended that choice. Yes. And the, and the number two pick, uh, very different. Number two, just barely behind it, behind by only one million and possibly going to take over. Uh, the Hangover Part 2, Zookeeper, Harry Potter, The Smurfs, Rise of the Apes, and The Change-Up. So uh, it'll be interesting. I, I love how many different ways there are to win. That's really surprising for me. There's so many ways to win. One of them <laughs> is going to Netflix.com slash twit for a 30-day free trial. <laughs> yes, absolutely. How great is Netflix? Have you heard of this thing? Shh, it's a brand actually, new service. No, you know what? We should, probably shouldn't tell people about this. Netflix.com slash twit will give them free 30-day trials. Oh, but then they won't make any money. Well, I am if too many people go, I'm worried. I'm concerned. Okay, listen. Listen, I'm, I, I, we're not supposed to do this, all right? We're not supposed to say it live on the air. It's supposed to be a secret. They only gave us 12 coupons. Go to Netflix.com slash Twitch. I'm trying to imagine if they only gave us like 12. <laughs> I know. 12. And, and <laughs> definitely server. don't tell everyone you know to go there. Because, I no. mean, it will work for anybody who goes to that URL. Well, but, see, but, but if they do that, oh, poor Netflix, what are they going to do? Before you know it, they'll have thousands of people for free downloading instant streaming movies to their iPads, their iPhones, their Xbox 360s, their Wii, Nintendo Wiis, their, their PS3s, all these devices. They'll be able to access thousands of movies. And poor Netflix is just going to have to eat the bandwidth cost for 30 whole days. I don't know uh, if, if this is... If it's right, if it's true that we only have 12 coupons, but just in case, you, you'll want to hurry. You want to go there really quickly. Uh, Netflix.com. Offer expires time. soon. Yeah. So hurry now. Let's move on to Tube Tops. All right, Brian Brushwood, you win. Lawrence Myers is on your side at BigHollywood.com about why Breaking Bad is going to suffer because of Mad Men. Now, here's the part, and it's not just like, you know, I, I said it from the outside. I was sitting on the outside, I'm like, you know, three stories side by side. Mad Men asks for record contract from AMC. Breaking Bad, wrapping things up. Walking Dead cuts budget, slashes, loses director. You know, to me, sitting on the outside, I was like, well, these are clearly related. But what I didn't realize is how they're all related. And I highly recommend this. If you go to, to, to Big Hollywood, uh, Lawrence Myers breaks it down, and he says that the flaw is not uh, if there's one thing to point to it's not just that 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 amc uh r ran out of money because mad men were jerks they genuinely are delivering a good product and of course amc doesn't own mad men they license it and because they from were doing Lionsgate, so well right oh, what's that from Lionsgate. yes correct correct but it still cost them a lot to license it Yes, absolutely. But uh, and Mad Men, if it, with, their point is, is back in the good old days when AMC was part of Cablevision, Mad Men could have asked 
for $30 million and gotten it. And they would have made up the, the rest of their budget by pulling that money from all of the other channels. It would have been part of a bigger pie. But because AMC is split off on its own, they've got shareholders to answer to. So they had to cough up that money. They're not going to cancel Mad Men. They're not going to let Mad Men get away. They, get, they got bent over a barrel and Mad Men walked away with $30 million. Then they turn around and because they're a tiny ship now, they really did have to make cuts. And that's why we're seeing Breaking Bad wrapping things up in only one more season, which totally breaks my heart. That's why we're seeing the visionary that made this made uh, The Walking Dead such an awesome big budget event last year. You know, the most successful in all of cable television history in their demographic. They're having to cut and lose big talent. And it really uh, it really, number one, it breaks my heart, but number two, it does feel good to be right. I like it when other people agree with me in big fancy articles. You know, I, I would say that don't blame Mad Men for this. Blame studio management. Because what they did, according to what this guy's saying anyway in the article, uh, they gave Mad Men too good of a deal. They gave Mad Men a better deal than they could afford to give them, and now they're stuck. Yes, correct. And, I, and I, it'll be interesting to see what happens for, uh, you know, AMC had been really building a reputation for high quality storytelling. And I don't know that they're going to be able to afford to do that outside of Mad Men. Uh, I like the way you wrap things up in this article saying the takeaway is, so what is the takeaway for big Hollywood readers? Normally I rant about content quality appears to be the pri primary culprit for the increasing rejection of Hollywood by middle, middle America. Content quality is directly related to the bizarro world business practices within the industry that are literally the reverse of how things are done everywhere else. Here we have a situation where the content quality is strong, but the business practices are so loony, they literally undermine the ability of the content provider to continue providing that content for a reasonable price. And I, I totally, seeing it from his perspective, I think, I think he's nailed it on this one. Android developers are getting a preview for requirements and an API that will allow them to create apps for Google TV. So we've been waiting forever for the Android marketplace to come to Google TV because that could change everything. Uh, Google well, TV sure. be could, could become much better, much more useful. Uh, Google says, yeah, we're going to bring it out on other devices, not just the Logitech review. We're going to come out with new equipment. Of course, there's the, uh, in the off thing, the idea if they are allowed to purchase Motorola Mobility, Motorola makes set-top boxes, so that could be one option there. Uh, but in the, in the meantime, app developers can uh, try out their apps with this preview to see if they will work on Google TV when the Android marketplace eventually does show up as an update to Google TV. And, and one of yep. the things they can get is access to the program guide and to changing channels. So there's some interesting apps. I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking of like, well, gosh, I'd like to have, you know, a lot of these video apps on my Google TV and maybe some games and stuff. That'd be kind of cool. Uh, but the ability to actually have apps that control your viewing experience is interesting. Well, and yeah, and there, uh, wait, a couple of things. First of all, I, I don't think we've had a Logitech review story since I got my hands on them. I, know, I, I think they dropped down to $99 now, right? Logitech yeah, that's reviews right. Logitech reviews are only $99. Uh, I was over at um, Digital Kitty, one, uh, one uh, Twit Colleen's house, and uh, uh, loved it. I loved it. And I, I would love to see a little more digital house, horsepower behind it. But by opening up the Android marketplace, we give it a chance to essentially be a player in the console wars. Because nowadays, the big three consoles are so outdated compared to high-end PC gaming that you don't you could very cheaply get some decent horsepower behind it and it could be a casual gamer console. Maybe that's what they're looking to move into. Yeah, well, I mean, that you can get Angry Birds on the Roku now, right? Even though right. it doesn't have an app store per se. They have that, that ability to add apps from a channel store. Uh, you, Apple TV doesn't have an app store, but they, you know, they have that ability, because it's iOS, to add one at any moment. So that's the race right now, is, is to come up with that device that's going to give you the extra thing that brings it into your room. Because I think you're right. Google TV isn't bad for watching video. I use it for Netflix all the time uh, in, our, in our back room. But uh, it, it just doesn't have anything that grabs people people's attention and says, oh, that's the thing I want to go buy it for. Whereas Roku, yes. it was so cheap to begin with, it's less than $99, that it's like the idea that you can do anything off the internet with it at all for that price is what gets like 60 bucks and I can stream? Uh, yeah, sure. Why not pick it up? Well, but think about it this way. What if they, let's say the Logitech review is sort of the baseline of the computing horsepower behind it, and they open up the Android marketplace and we're comparable with what you can get on your smartphone or, or in that area, then once people get accustomed to the idea of playing certain games or using some unconventional apps on their Google television, then imagine that they're able to raise the price by saying, okay, now get 
the the review HD, which has twice the processing power, you know, dual core, d double the RAM, to start, first of all, just get people accustomed to using this device cheaply in the Roku review kind of way, but then use that leverage of the marketplace to slowly make it a casual gaming console. And Ninja Hacker in the chat room says, if we bring apps to a TV, does that essentially mean we'll finally have a la carte TV? Not for everything. Not everybody's going to make their app available on the platform. Hulu probably will not make Hulu Plus available in the Android marketplace for some unearthly reason. Uh, but, yes, you will be able to get apps, and that's actually what you see with the Roku. You have a la carte TV. Maybe you don't have all of the channels that you have on cable yet, but you have the ability to pick and choose what you want to watch, and you can get some really cool stuff. Twit has an app there. CNET has an app there. You can get things like Al Jazeera. Uh, you can get foreign movies, public domain movies, uh, lots of sports, UFC, NBA, MLB. I guess NFL is going to have an app on the PS3 now, not on the Roku. But, but yeah, I mean, that is exactly the promise of this stuff is you get to pick what it is you're interested in and watch it. Yeah, I like the idea. Maybe these apps would be the kind of the equivalent to where we see a lot of bands try to work outside of the iTunes 99 cent processing by creating their own app for different uh, albums that they release. It'd be interesting if essentially we started seeing channels do the same thing with like the NFL content. Yeah. All right. Uh, coming up this weekend, Doctor Who returns to the BBC in the UK and BBC America here in the US. Uh, so this is the second half of the season. They sort of took a summer break uh, this year instead of running them all, all of the series as one uh, thing. So we're, we're picking up, I think, with episode eight, uh, and it's called Let's Kill Hitler, uh, which is always a fun <laughs> time travel thought experiment. Like, why doesn't somebody just go kill Hitler? Unfortunately, this one's not a time travel experiment. It's Larry Hitler. He uh, down the road. Is that right? Guy, I don't think grins. that's right. That would be sad if that were true. Um, but, yeah, so I, anyway, I'm still enjoying Breaking Bad's killing it every week. Uh, I'm still loving Haven. It's just a little little secret gem that I hope doesn't get squashed. Um, but, yeah, have you been uh, watching everything? You've been traveling so much. I, I imagine is, you haven't had much of a chance. Week. Yeah, this is the week that all the students come back to school. And so, literally, I have a eight-day stretch where I'm in six different states. Uh, I've, I've been on a plane every single day for five days straight now. And uh, last night was the first night I slept more than four hours in a row. And this afternoon was the first time since last week that I was at a place that had internet and was able to access my laptop. So for the first time today uh, in a week, I was able to log into Gmail. So I'm so far behind, I haven't been able to watch anything. But I do have my iPad filled with a bunch of fringe episodes. So I'm continuing to plow through the first season. Okay. And I'm really glad that I'm going through all these Monster of the Week episodes, knowing that it'll give a bigger context to stuff that comes up later. And I'm enjoying them. I'm enjoying them for what they are. All right, good. Let's move on to interference. This week's segment of Interferon has no Jeff Goldblum, but it does have a victory for Safe Harbor. Uh, EMI is suing MP3 Tunes, that was Michael Robertson's uh, firm, over the uploading of music to a digital locker. Now, what the court said was that the DMCA has a protection for MP3 Tunes as a safe harbor. So MP3 Tunes is not responsible for any infringement caused by any of its users. That's huge. That is, yes. a, that is a big, positive consumer ruling here. They also, however, gave EMI a little victory by uh, ruling that Michael Robertson himself violated copyright by uploading copyrighted music to the <laughs> to the cloud. So, oh, wait, so, so wait, so they, they, they ruled the they ruled the the cloud not liable. He but is, as he demonstrated the benefit of it by uploading mu yes. music to the cloud. He like, is okay, personally liable for music he uploaded to the service without permission of the copyright owners. Wow, that is hilarious. Um, but and it I, does say, look, if you if you want to create these lockers, these online uh, services, uh, you how, you basically have to respond if somebody says, hey, you got to take that stuff down. But as long as you do that, that's the safe harbor agreement. You're safe. You're not going right. to be found responsible for the things people put in their locker. Right, correct. And of course, now obviously, you know, this we're, we're frame rates, so why are we talking about a music decision? Uh, the principle and the precedent here is extremely important because, as you know, a lot of what we're seeing in the digital video world with film and, and digital distribution is the same story we saw a decade ago 
with MP3s. And so finally, we're getting to this point where we're finally we're seeing, you know, common sense decision making. And this is going to pave the way to protect companies, to allow them to invest more time and effort to bringing us the kind of content that we want, the way we want to enjoy it. Now, here's the part I don't like. The judge said that MP3 Tunes is responsible for removing infringing materials out of people's lockers, and if the files stored by numerous people were obtained from the same source, MP3 Tunes is responsible for chasing all the copies down and pulling them. So he's still putting a burden saying, if people have put stolen stuff in their locker and you become aware of it, if you're made aware of it, you have to follow safe harbor rules and remove it, and you have to remove all the copies of the same thing. Uh, no now, matter what did, locker it's in. Now, in the case of a locker, um, how, how does it know, and, and uh, you obviously have been following all this stuff much longer than, than I have, but how does it know the difference between your, your legal one backup copy versus an, an illegal copy? Or, yeah, or exactly. That's easier said than done, right? I mean, yeah. theoretically, it's saying, oh, well, if this copy... Uh, you know, is, is a perfect copy, and EMI says, hey, that's infringing, uh, then when it's, when it's found anywhere, it should have a digital signature that matches, and you get rid of it everywhere. In fact, the MP3 Tunes is designed to work that way, to say, like, hey, that's the same song as this song, so we're going to just store it in one place and have everybody point to it. Uh, so right. theoretically, that would work. But, yeah, what if I say, you know, forget MP3 Tunes and the way it works. What if I say I have a locker and I, I have uploaded my legally purchased but not DRM'd iTunes music, right. uh, and then someone else pirates uh, iTunes music, and I've got the same signature, right? Yeah, right. How does that work? Uh, well, I'm sure there'll be plenty more lawsuits to work that out. Look I forward to more lawsuits. I think you're right. <laughs> this actually is probably copyright infringement right here, but really... It's newsworthy. This is why we need different copyright laws, because this should not be infringing in any way. And I bet Tom Waits is smart enough not to send a takedown notice, uh, but I found this on Boing Boing today. Cory Doctorow posted it up. A YouTube mashup of Tom Waits's God's Away on Business with Cookie Monster clips. Now you have to have the sound up for this to work. Because if you just look at the video, it's like, no, oh, it's just a bunch of Cookie Monster. If you just listen to the Tom Waits song, it's like, that's oh, Tom Waits singing. He sings kind of weird. If you're looking for someone to put you out of that ditch, you're out of luck. You're out of luck. Ship is sinking. The ship is sinking. The ship is sinking. Now, you start to watch this, you start to get convinced, like, that's just Cookie Monster singing, right? Like, no, that's Tom I, Waits. Uh, I, I, I love it, because when I, I honestly couldn't decide, and I was not familiar with the Tom Waits song, although I'm familiar with Tom Waits' voice, but I wasn't sure enough. I'm like, is that actually Tom Waits, or is that somebody singing a Tom Waits song in a Cookie Monster to make fun of Tom Waits' normal singing style? But knowing it's the real track makes it even better. And, in fact, there's some fantastic um, uh, linguistic tests that you can see on on YouTube where they play the exact same audio of of a, a certain syllable being made but then they show different different yeah. um, whether it's a pop or uh -huh. a ma and then uh, looking at the lip placement actually makes you hear and perceive the sound differently. Yeah. And I think that just seeing Cookie Monster doing that we're like this is clearly an intentional parody of Cookie Monster making this song. Absolutely, and, and, and it, really, it really works, and it's really weird uh, and awesome. And should that, that should not be illegal, right? No. I mean, I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying it's going to get taken down, but that is remix. It's, well, it's the, the it's, uh, and, and we've talked about this before as well. They, you know, YouTube has their clean and dirty, easy way to understand copyright law, which actually makes it more confusing because they're like, this bad, this bad, this bad. Fair use, okay. Well, what's fair use? They're like, hey, look over there. The dog has a puffy tail. It's like we need to hash yeah. this out with, uh, in order to, to, to get it all settled. And we do have the link to that copyright video. If we could jump in like maybe uh, one minute in. He starts off talking about how the exact language in the Constitution of the United States of America says to promote more, uh, you know, more science and more art, you should have a limited protection under copyright. Uh, and so think about this. The stated reason for it is so that you can have a reason for more people to create more beautiful art, uh, and yet these are the unintended consequences of the continuous expansion of copyright And what I like law. about this video is it's doing the thing that I think needs to be done when we evaluate copyright law, which is, is it promoting 
creativity and art. Correct. And it is a, it is approaching copyright law from that perspective. Do we have? Yep. Do we have a yeah, we, do, we got it right here. Released Star Wars: A New Hope in 1977. That's more than 28 years ago. So great, get filming. Alas, no. While Star Wars should have lost copyright protection in 2005, it's actually copyrighted until 95 years after publication, not 28. So you can't use it unless Lucas lets you. Why does his copyright last for ages? Well, as long as there has been copyright, there have been authors arguing that it's too short. And perhaps they're right. How's a poor guy like Lucas supposed to turn a profit in the mere 28 years between 1977 and 2005? After all, there was only the theatrical release of A New Hope, and the theatrical re-release in 1978, and again in 1979, and 1981, and 1982, and then there was the 1982 VHS and Betamax releases, the 1984 broadcast television release, the 1985 Laserdisc release, the 1989 widescreen Laserdisc release, the 1990 VHS re-release, the 1992 widescreen VHS release, the 1993 Laserdisc re-release, the 1995 VHS re-release, the 1997 special edition theatrical release, Han Shot First You Bastard, the 1997 VHS special edition release, and the 2004 DVD release. And now you, dear filmmaker, come along and want to make your own version of Star Wars A New Hope for shame. That's like stealing food right out of George Lucas's mouth. Four times Congress has agreed with authors... <laughs> so anyway, it, that, that's, that's my favorite part of it because it's using that as an example of, look, this, this copyright law is not working the way it was intended to work. You can make all kinds of arguments of why it should work that way, but that is not the way it was intended to work in the first place. Well, and here's the great betrayal is when he said, uh, look, nobody, the fact that you are protecting copyright after the death of the creator is the part that really shuts everything down because nobody is, how are you going to incentivize somebody to create more stuff after they're dead, right? They're gonna, the, the fact that, you know, uh, and he points out J.K. Rowling, she's, she, she didn't, she wasn't stymied by the fact that uh, that she would no longer have copyright after 70 years after her death. You know, she created it because she had a story to tell. And and after a certain amount of time, other people should be able to tell their own stories with this this fable. And then the worst part is when he says that the reason that it's expanded so long is because of corporations like the Walt Disney Company, which uh, they made their living. They made their entire business by taking old stories that were in the public domain and telling their own version of them really well and making them very popular. Now they have a stranglehold on those properties that they picked up for free out of the public domain. Wait, 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 I mean, Brian, Brian uh, what? we're actually probably violating copyright here because we're using CGP Gray's stuff as a source for telling our own version of how copyright should work. Uh, you know what? Um, Maybe it's time to move on to feedback. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's, let's move on. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Flame Radio, yeah. Joe Cassidy writes in and says, Greetings, gentlemen. I heard of your Star Wars experiment, and I believe there is a third way to introduce someone to the Star Wars Sega. A third way? Are you crazy, Joe Cassidy? Here's what he says. The way I plan on revealing the story to my kids is episode four, five, and one. What? So, yeah, see, wait, four, wait, five. See, a new oh, four, five, Empire one. Strikes back. Two, three, and then six. So he saves Return of the Jedi for the end. Not only right. is it a way to still be surprised with Vader disclosing his relationship, spoiler alert, blue, uh, it also makes the Ewoks much easier to stomach after suffering the nausea that is Jar Jar. Just an idea I had that, like frame rate, is so brilliant I had to share. Oh, thanks, Joe. Keep up the good work. Uh, J. Brian Holsey, which, uh, who you may remember, this is the guy who uh, inadvertently, uh, or who gave to me the big fat spoiler that I handed off to you that you read aloud about Caprica, the major spoiler here. J. Brian Holsey says, I'm no longer sorry for the whole Caprica thing. Why? Because, as always, Tom's asinine opinion is wrong. The entire idea as of suspense... Always? Of suspense, <laughs> mystery, surprise. It's in print, Tom. You can't deny it. And of, and, of course, magic is the reveal. A spoiler is when that reveal is made to you, one, against your will, two, outside of the context of the story. When you put that the reveal at the beginning but make it part of the story or at least make it seem as if that were the original intention of the author, filmmaker, etc., those two uh, criteria go away. Therefore, not the same as a spoiler. It also makes a completely different story and experience from both the original and a truly spoiled one. Uh, now, what about Tom's point about watching a movie uh, or reading a book a second time? Actually, that was my point. Uh, well, this was a good try, but not the same as spoilers, making things better, because knowing the story by having fully experienced it on your own is not a spoiler. And he goes on to, to go on and, and say all that and in your face with the Caprica spoiler, he says. Well, I will now enjoy Caprica so much more because... <laughs> 
of your spoiler. So I really should thank him. Sure. That's uh, uh, thank you very much for the Caprica spoilers. Keep them coming. No, and I, I, honestly, you know, and as I revealed at the end of the last episode, I, I definitely was playing devil's advocate there, uh, and and I think he makes some good good points about the fact that even if technically, in both cases, whether it's written intentionally or not, you're getting information about the end of a story beforehand, there is a perceptive difference between having it delivered from the author and having it delivered against your will by someone outside the author. Even, even if factually it's the same information, if it's not delivered from the author, it means something different to you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, hey, Tom and Brian. First off, got to do the fan thing. Say, great show. Oh, thanks, Greg. K. Yeah, we hate it when you do that. Yeah. Please stop uh, starting off every letter by saying how great frame rate is. The discussion regarding if spoilers add to the enjoyment of something last week really got me going while watching the show, and I have to say that I am in complete disagreement with Tom. He tried to use the example of movies and TV shows that started with the end of a story and then showed you how things arrived at the, that point, but by definition, that isn't the end of a story anymore. It's the beginning and therefore can't be called a spoiler. So he's using the definitional, like, well, it's not a spoiler if the author intended it. So it kind of goes back to the same thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we've got a lot of people chiming in on the spoiler thing. Uh, let's see, one other... Um, yeah, I get more people agreeing with this, but I thought this was, this is a neat, uh, uh, at the end of the letter that Keith chimed in on, on spoilers, he says, for the Netflix Blu-ray question, Redbox has Blu-rays, and they do have special features on them. If you use their website or smartphone app, you can reserve the movie you're interested in, and whichever the box is near you, it's currently available. Sure, it's a bit less convenient, and you get charged for each day you have the disc, but it's a $1.50 rental instead of 10 to 15 bucks per month, whether you use it or not. So I thought that was a really good little, um... A uh, little extra tidbit there. All right. And then Mike wrote in and says, Hi, Tom and Brian. I was wondering if you could learn more about the Netflix recommendation engine and explain it to the rest of us. I've rated over 7,000 movies, and they give lousy recommendations. The more movies I rate, the worse they get. The My Top 10 section has 10 movies that aren't even in my top 1,000. Maybe you can find out why Netflix suggestions are so lousy. Love the show. Well, Mike, now, this is there's three different reasons that I can give you for why this may be happening. Well, okay. Well, and, and I was surprised to read this. I had never, this is literally the first time I've ever heard anyone say that the Netflix recommendation engine is lousy because to me it's like mind reading. And in fact, they offered that million dollar prize to, to, to anyone who could enhance the, the reliability of it by even like 5% or something ridiculous, right? Yeah, well, that's reason number one is it's very difficult to do this. And they actually had that contest. I was going to bring that up where they were like trying to get people to help with the recommendation engine. So they're not done working on it. That's still something that they're trying to perfect. Uh, reason number two could be that you're not aware that your movie taste is actually awful and Netflix is informing you this in the nicest way they can. <laughs> um, the third possibility is that you have watched all the good movies, and there's just yep. nothing left for them to recommend. Well, and, and I, I don't know. I guess <laughs> I, like, I like how you accepted that one. You're like, well, it could be. No, no, no. Well, I mean, specifically what I was going to say is, because uh, that is true, there, there is... For you, there will be some quantity of the best movies in any one category. And once you've watched those, you may think you want more in that category, but it turns out you just have watched all the best ones that there is for that. You know, for me, it was like, you know, I thought, like, I must love anime because I love these eight movies. And then I was like, no, I just love these eight movies. And yeah. uh, anime in general, eh, okay. Uh, but, uh, and so, uh, which not, please don't, I, I do like anime, but that was a phase I went through. But uh, specifically, it may make a recommendation for you, but I find the, 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 our guess for what Brian will like, a number of stars, tends to be uncannily accurate for me. You know, like a movie that I've never seen before. I'm like, yeah, man, that's about, that's about two and a half stars. That's three and a half stars. That I'd kind say of it's about 70% for me. I mean, they, they, they put some clunkers in there where I'm like, where did this come from? Or they, you know what, the thing is, I haven't been able to test that accurately since, they, uh, since we removed our separate accounts. When we went to pretty much doing streaming, and we only and we went down to just having one disc a month, uh, yeah. I I I had I ended up just removing my account, you know, because you you can have multiple accounts under one account. I removed my login because I couldn't use it for streaming, and we only had one disc coming anyway. So now my recommendations are mixed up with Eileen's. So it's well, kind and of here's the, polluted. Here's anyway. the other thing. Uh, I've noticed also that the recommendations that I get, um, I rated a bunch of movies that I liked and uh, at first was getting appropriate recommendations. But then I noticed that when I let my kids start watching stuff, now it makes recommendations based on my past history of what I've watched 
not on what I necessarily rated highly. So now it's recommending a bunch of kids stuff for me. Like my account's kind yeah. of closed in that regard. But I wonder if there's a way to tell it like, okay, don't pay attention to what I actually watch. Pay attention to what I say I like. Uh, that would be helpful. Can you imagine if Netflix was able to just say, like, you know, like a Nielsen box, like, who's watching this streaming video right now in your household, and then create recommendations based on, like, you could just punch in and punch out. Like, Dude, so, you like, won't even like have to. With three your, of us are with, watching a movie, and, with your, and you actually just say, like, oh, I, I'm giving up halfway through, and then your personal rating for that kind of movie goes down a little bit versus the other two people who hung out and watched it all the way through. You, you can do that right now. There's technologically no reason you can't do that with your Xbox Connect right now. Have it recognize all the faces of the yeah, people who are sitting on the couch. See who gets up and leaves. I mean, this is, this is doable at this moment, and I wouldn't be surprised if in limited households we saw that within the next two years. I like it. Go get it, Microsoft. <laughs> That's it uh, for this edition of Frame Rate. Brian, uh, thanks uh, again for a lovely, uh, a lovely show. Dude, it was fantastic, and thank you to the Wi-Fi here at this hotel. It Apparently worked. the one megabit upload was not a lie. Do me a favor, drop us an email to frameratio at gmail.com or, you know, follow us on the on the G Pluses, Google Pluses. Good job, Palatine. Yeah. We are, we are happy with your Wi-Fi. Go Pirates. That's it uh, for this edition of Frame Rate. We'll see you next time.